I would encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 in your Bibles. I wanted to remind you that tonight at 6 o'clock we are going to have a work and witness presentation. You might uh, be interested in hearing what it is that uh, the team did. You might be interested in exploring uh, what it is that God might do on a next trip, where we might go, and, and uh, your possible involvement. You might even sense a call to the mission field and would like to know more about it. Tonight is a great night. You might just be interested, you know what, I want to go taste what other people made and hang out with some people. That's a great reason to come too. But tonight at 6 o'clock, hope to see you and uh, would love to have you uh, be a part of that service. Luke chapter 18. Just a couple verses this morning, verses 15 to 17. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. There is a war going on for the heart, the soul, the mind of our children. This is the concluding message of the central part of the mission statement that we have shared with you about family. And this morning, we are talking about the kingdom and kids. Some of the, the reason why I am using my iPad this morning when I don't normally here as of late is because there's so much information that I wanted to share with you in the beginning of this message that there was no way I could memorize it all, at least in a one-week period of time. There is a war going on, folks, for the heart and mind of our children. There's a war going on in, in our culture that is specifically targeted to, to families with children. Now, you heard me say in the vision uh, presentation that we were targeting children and teenagers and by extension their parents. I also said in that message that targeting that demographic does not mean that we exclude or neglect or devalue those that are outside of that demographic. I am outside of that demographic. But there is a specific battle going on in this area in our culture. And the church, if it is to be a relevant voice into culture, we must wrestle with what it is that is going on. Do you know that one in five children are born into poverty into the United States, one in 10 into extreme poverty? In the South, 25% of children are born into poverty. 60% of all children fail to read at grade level by the fourth and the eighth grade. If you look at African-American students, that percentage rises to 80%. If you look at Hispanic children, that number is 75%. 75% of the children, Hispanic children, 80% of the black children, 60% of the entire population aren't reading at fourth and eighth grade levels. 500,000 children drop out of high school every year. Every 33 seconds, a child is arrested for committing a crime. During the course of our worship service, 109 children will be arrested in America. In 2012, the most recent data I was able to, to get, 1.162 million children went to school having had no place to sleep the night before. Homeless children. Since 1980, 1 1.3 billion children were aborted worldwide. 950,000 children aborted this year in the United States alone. Over 58 million babies have been aborted in the United States since Roe v. Wade. If you have a hard time figuring out that number, let me give you an image. Take every person who lives in South Carolina and their life. Fill it again and their life. Fill it again. Fill it again. Fill it again. 
fill it again, 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 fill it again. 60 million children gone. Now, I recognize that it is entirely possible that someone in our sanctuary today has experienced that in your own life. By no means am I elevating abortion above any other sin in America. The power of the grace of Jesus Christ is more than sufficient to set us free from any sin or wrong decision that we've made. But this is a serious issue in America. Well, what about folks, average folks like us who are seated in church today? Did you realize in 2009 alone, companies spent $17 billion marketing just to your children? $17 billion in one year to convince your children of what they think your children need. Thanks a lot, right? Why? Psychologists, children's psychologists have discovered that if you look at what you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 95% of the time, children influence what you eat. If you look at where you go on vacation, over 95% of the decisions made in homes where children live, the children influence where you go. If you look at the software and the computers that you buy, the entertainment systems that you buy, over 95% of those decisions are influenced by the children in your home. One advertising agency put it this way, quote, we're relying on the kids to pester mom to buy the product. We don't go after mom. Marketing agencies in the 1990s began to hire children's psychologists to help shape their understanding of the psychological DNA of our children. Once they discovered what it was that children's psychologists already knew, they began to radically change how it is that they market to your family through the life of your child. I was sharing this illustration with my wife here, and she was sharing with me a commercial that I had not seen about as a Target commercial with kids jumping through this misty fog into a Target store where all these wonderful toys are. You see, folks, all of this is connected. All of this marketing is connected. What it is that, that you see in movies, what it is that is placed in schools, all of this stuff is interconnected to influence your children to want certain things. There were some psychologists in the United States that entered into a movement in the late 1990s and early 2000s to make what it was that was happening by using child psychologists in the marketing industry to make it an unethical practice for medical doctors to engage in. They failed. So today, the practice remains. Research is done by child psychologists to try to get inside your children's mind to influence what it is that you do in your home. Well, I wish it was just kids. The family is subject to this same stuff. A couple years ago, all the rage was North Face. Everybody had to get a North Face something or other. Your status was determined by whether or not you had North Face. I couldn't believe it. There, were, there was this sale last year at one of the sporting goods stores, and they had North Face sweaters on sale, you know, sweatshirts on sale, and then another non-North Face brand that was a little bit less and when by the time we got to the store, the more expensive garment was gone, the less expensive garment wasn't. And I was scratching my head saying, well, why in the world was a North Face better? And I would venture to guess that most of us don't have a clue why North Face is better. Marketing agents tell us they do not sell products. You need to understand that. They are not selling you a product. They are selling you a brand. Most of us cannot clearly articulate why it is that our brand of preference is better than another brand. Most of us cannot do that. We need to come to terms with the fact that marketing companies are influencing our families in powerful and significant ways. So I did some study. What, makes, what is the best shoe? 
I couldn't find any research. Somebody, I just heard Nike. No, I, I looked it up. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not talking about cleats for soccer or running shoes for track or something. Just a basic shoe for your child to wear. Do you know what the, the biggest influencer is on the quality of shoe? It's how it's made. If, if you give a, an active kid the little running shoes with the lip on the front, those don't last very long because kids tend to drag their feet and, and it rips the front of the sole off so they don't last as long. The only, the only thing that matters as to what it is that makes your kid's shoe last longer is not the name brand, it's the way in which that shoe is made. So, but what do we do? We spend $125 on a shoe because it's a brand. I lived on pay less. My parents made me live on pay less. <laughs> and I felt less of a human being for it. Because it wasn't the brand. An article was posted in Psychology Today within the last year. It was authored by Dr. Phil Zuckerman. Psychology Today published the article that suggests that Christianity is abusive to children. He said this, our belief that we are born sinners in need of salvation, that we need to be saved from sin, that Jesus sent his son to die on a cross for the remission of sin, that there is a real heaven and hell and other similar beliefs are all dangerous and potentially abusive to children. To summarize, quote, what hasn't been trumpeted nearly enough, nor studied nearly enough, is the potentially dangerous aspects of Christianity, aspects that stem from the very core central tenets of that faith, end quote. Can you believe it? There's a move in America to make what it is that we are teaching our children abusive? Finally, according to research done actually by Southern Nazarene University and others, 86% of people who profess to being Christian came to be a Christian before the age of 15. 10% did so before the age of 30 and 15, and 4% became a Christian after the age of 30. 96% of people came to decide that, that they were going to be Christian before the age of 30. Can we agree now for a moment that there is a war going on for the heart and mind and soul of our families? I do not speak about the need to emphasize ministry to children and teenagers and by extension their parents because it is cool or hip to do so in the church. I do so because there is a war that is taking place. And Terry stood up here and talked about Debbie, who was in a cab in South Philly. If she doesn't get it by the time she's 18, is she ever going to get it? There is a war going on in the life of our families. So the first thought of this message this morning is this. Kids are important to Jesus, and they should be important to us. How important is it to you that we have children and their parents in our community of faith? Have you ever just really asked that question? Is it important to me that, that there are children that are a part of our church? I loved seeing the children sing this morning. And when they hit that one part where they were singing alone, I was, Jesus was jumping up and down and cheering at that moment. Is, is it important to you that there are children in our church? 
What are you willing to sacrifice for the welfare and spiritual growth of the young? Over the last 10 years, I am told that we have seen an exodus of young families with children in our church. I'm told that the reasons for this are many, and at this moment, honestly, don't matter. I believe that our church reflects at least some value for children. We have a staff position allocated to that. We have what I would consider to be a decent budget to help facilitate ministry to children. But, but these two things don't inconvenience us as a community of faith. As long as the children's pastor is doing their thing, as long as a few children's workers are doing their things, as long as I can send my kids somewhere and, and have them be cared for, it doesn't inconvenience us. Where, where do you think we stand as a church as it relates to, to children? Do we, do we genuinely care about children beyond, beyond having a staff person, beyond a budget? In what way is our church combating this ongoing war against our families? Every, again, every age group is important. Uh, no one can accuse me of not at least saying that. But, but we've got an issue here. If, if we don't engage in an aggressive, intentional plan to help our families combat this, eternity is going to be different. And it's not a good different. We, we, but if we engage in, in an intentional, proactive plan to combat what it is that's happening in secular society, we can create an opportunity for our families to have the tools and the resources to combat all the exterior influences that are coming outside into the home. I am not the target. I am 44, and I'm outside the target. My kids are at college. They're outside the target group. And there are times when I consider what it means to, to reach out and influence children and teenagers and their parents, and sometimes it can inconvenience us. Because those that are outside that demographic might prefer something else. But 96% of people who come to faith do so in the target group. I'm outside. I, folks, not that I've already obtained all this. But God calls me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I'm in with Jesus. I'm not going anywhere. I don't care what anybody does, what anybody says. I'm, I'm in with Jesus. I'm going to grow in my faith. I don't care what culture says. I don't care what culture says I can and can't do. I'm going with Jesus. End of story. All right? But our children are sh being shaped today. And our activity as a community of faith is going to have a significant influence on whether or not they are in with Jesus when they're 44. One of our retired folks came up to me a couple weeks ago. He said, Pastor, you know that? But then he mentioned a song. Because I didn't like that song. I busted up laughing. I busted up laughing because I thought the same thing. I didn't like that song too much either, to be quite honest with you. It just kept going on and on and on, saying the same thing over and over and over again. I didn't like it too much either. <laughs> and uh, he said, but you know what? I was laying in bed one night, and uh, God came over me. I started singing that song, and the words captured my imagination. And I began to hear that song for what it was meant to be. And God changed my heart. And I can't stop singing that song anymore. Do you know why that song just keeps going on and on about the same thing? It's because our young don't believe it. It becomes an altar call for them. They don't believe the song. And the song's intent is to drive home that that God really does call them loved. 
That's the point. They, they're, they're told if I don't have North Face, if I don't have Nike, if I don't go to Disney, if I don't spend all this money on cars while my friends are driving around this, I've got this thing that can barely start in the morning. If I don't have all of the stuff that society says that I'm supposed to have, then I am nothing in our society. How in the world can God love somebody that everyone else says is worthless? The song goes on and on because our young people don't believe it. And the song's purpose is to help them come to believe that the words of that song really are true and that the message in Scripture really is true. I'm committed to Greenville First Nazarene. I'm committed to GFN Church for two reasons. One, it's Nazarene. And two, we're on mission. Pretty much everything else can change for me. If we stop being Nazarene, I'm gone. And if we stop being on mission... I'd be discouraged. I'm I'm in because of those two things. Well, that's about us. We need to wrestle with this, folks. What are we willing to sacrifice as a church in order to reach a demographic that is being assaulted by our culture? assaulted by our culture. This is mission critical. The church in America is dying, dying, and we cannot let it happen in Greenville. Somebody say amen to that. Second thought today is the kids will not find the kingdom unless they're brought to the kingdom. Contrary to popular belief, taking your children to church is not the same as taking your children to the kingdom. Bringing your kids to church is one-seventh of their week. And if you think, my brothers and sisters who have children, that bringing your children to church is going to help them have a dynamic... Bringing your children to church alone is going to help them have a dynamic relationship with Jesus. I'm sorry, but you are painfully wrong. Church alone, one hour on a Sunday, is not enough to undo 24, 6 plus 23 hours of secular influence in their life. It is not enough. We must engage in a reality check about what it is that society is trying to do to our families, to our children. It is a remarkable thing that God would allow us to partner with him in creating that which is going to live forever. We have a few families in our church that are going to be having children soon. The three that I'm thinking of are seated in our sanctuary today. It is a remarkable thing that God would allow you to, to partner with him to create something eternal. That's why we dedicate our children to the Lord. It is an expression of our giving back to him that which he has given to us so that he would give the child back to us with the understanding that I am now responsible, a steward of that which he has given to me. And that stewardship has eternal implications. It is a profound thing when a, when a husband and a wife have a child or when they adopt a child. That God would place this radical trust in us to raise a child in the way that he or she should go. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's, enormous, it's an enormous challenge, not, one not for the faint of hearted. And uh, one of the families in our sanctuary today is getting ready to have their first. They might be going home today saying, maybe we should have uh, listened to this message before uh, we uh, decided to have a child. <laughs> I hope not. If the secular humanism that is ingrained in our culture tells our child something on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then they hear something different on Sunday and hit repeat, who is doing the majority of the influencing of our children? 
we need to wrestle seriously with who is influencing our children. So kids must be brought to the kingdom, and it has to happen more than on Sunday. I know parenting can be hard, but you need to decide now, today, regardless of how old your children are, decide today that that how you live in relationship with your spouse, how you live in relationship with your children is going to be an expression of that which you value the most. That that you will not live by accident, that the things that take place in your home are going to be an extension of the life of Christ, not the life of secular humanism, not the life of secular culture, but that the life of Christ is going to emanate from your home intentionally, proactively, proactively, purposefully in relationship with your spouse if you're married, but you will not live another day on accident in relationship with your children. My wife and I made those decisions when our children were very young. It meant our kids were not going to do certain things that other kids did. They were not going to go places that other kids went. They were not going to be involved in things that other kids might be involved in. Our kids were not going to be given permission to do things. We were not going to buy into secular parenting philosophies. It breaks my heart when a parent tells me that prayer meeting is boring. There were a lot of times when I fell asleep in prayer meeting as a kid. But I will never forget those men and women. Their prayers changed my life. Bored me to death. And they changed my life in the process. Our kids were in church all the time. My my wife and I were painfully aware of of our parenting weaknesses individually. There were times when my wife would say, Terry, you messed up there, man. You need to, you need to fix that. There were times I told her, babe, we can't keep doing it like this. We got to do something different. We helped each other. We would not allow, as much as we were aware, the secular philosophies to influence our children. Worship, prayer, Spiritual conversations about current events, these things were non-negotiable for us. Don't get me wrong. My wife could tell you lots of stories about how I messed up as a dad. We weren't perfect at this. We still aren't. Um, daughters in college, that's a, that's, somebody needs to write a book about that. Uh, Are we prioritizing Christ, faith, worship, scripture? Are we doing that in our homes? Being a parent today is is painfully difficult. Being a parent today is hard, but, but it is still God's number one plan for the influence and spiritual development of the child. It's the number one plan. The church has a role to play, a significant and serious role to play, but you are still the number one influence. At the end of the day, your children are, still have a choice. They can still choose to, to do whatever it is that they do, and there are great parents that have, that have kids that, that just made decisions that broke parents' heart, that broke their hearts. But we are the, the primary tool do you, do you have conversations with your spouse if you're married about your spiritual goals in your family? Do you, do you have spiritual growth plans, intentional decisions as to what you will and will not do in your home that is designed to help you and help your children grow in faith? Do you know what that spiritual plan is for your children? Do you know how to combat the forces that are at work in the lives of your children Do you know how to create healthy parameters for the spiritual and the emotional and the relational growth of your children? Do you know the answers to these questions? If not, we need to surround each other 
and develop mentoring programs, develop parent relationships. Just this week, I have begun one of those, meeting with a 29-year-old dad in our church for the purpose of helping him as a brother in Christ and help him to lead his family. This is all we've got. And this is the cool part. This is Jesus' best plan. And his spirit comes and gives us the wisdom and the help that we need to accomplish his best for our kids. You can silence the marketing influences in the life of your children. We can help children read in our community. We can help our parents that are discouraged and don't know what to do. We can do this, folks, because Jesus is with us. We are not hopeless. We have the hope of Jesus Christ. Some of your parents are walking out there, man, what in the world am I going to do? Go in Jesus' name, in his power, in his spirit, talk to your spouse. So what then shall we do? Who do we talk to? What partnerships can we create? How are we going to fight the influences of our family from exterior places? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do it? So this morning, I'd like to pray for our moms and dads. If you have, I recognize that not all of you will want to come forward. I'm giving you an opportunity to come forward so we can pray for you. If you have children who are in high school to now, or to less than high school, they're senior in high school and younger, would you come and stand here with me? Stand up from where you are. We'd like to pray with you this morning. Come on down here. We'd like to pray for you today. These folks need us. And I want you to know, moms and dads, your pastor believes in you. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The power of God's Spirit here with you to give you the help, the wisdom, the strength, and sometimes even cross your fingers, rest as a mom and dad. It is tough, I know. But Jesus is with you. And your church family is with you. We will not let you face these forces alone. Would you repeat after me? I believe Jesus Christ can give me the strength to be the mom and dad that he has called me to be. Will you stand with me, congregation, as we pray together? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I lift these men and women to you today. We are family. When we entered into relationship with you, you adopted us as your sons and your daughters. Because of that, these men and women are my brothers and sisters. They are my family. I remember days as a dad with two beautiful daughters. There were days I did not know what to do. There were, there were days filled with such joy and days filled with such uncertainty. And because we have been adopted into your family, your Holy Spirit is in these men and women to give them the strength 
and the wisdom and the help that they need. And because we are family, they do not have to face these struggles alone. You have blessed us with the opportunity. You have blessed those who are not standing up here with the opportunity to bless those who are standing here. Father, I pray that you would bless these these moms, these dads. Help them as they raise their children, the children that you have entrusted to them. Will you encourage them, bless them, keep them? And Father, we may not always know which of them at this moment in their life needs help. Will you point out men and women in our church that they know, that they respect, that they love? And will you give them the strength to just go to that person and say, brother, sister, can you, can, can we go out for coffee? Can we go out for breakfast, lunch, dinner? Can we get together after church on a Sunday and, and just talk? I need some help in a specific area in my home. And And you look like you might be a person that could help me with that. Help us as a community of faith, as a church. Help me as the pastor and Pastor Brenda and others to be able to creatively strategize how we might help these men and women. Together as family, core to our mission, we will see our children thrive as Christ followers, prepared for the world that stands before them. Father, I believe in these men and women, these moms and dads, I believe in them, and you will help them today. And may the grace and peace of Jesus equip you with every good thing you need to be the mom and dad he's called you to be. And may he equip you, church, to see these men and women. And may you be sensitive to the Spirit's direction and reach out to that one that God has called you to bless in his name. And may we be a church that is not discouraged by the battle, but are encouraged that the Spirit goes before us and you will not let our children be defeated we will see victory in Jesus name amen